Excellent. <laughs> high Welcome. I'd like to call to order uh, the meeting of the Rutland City Board of School Commissioners. <laughs> um, and I would like to note that all commissioners are in attendance with um, Kathy Solsa is remote and um, absent are Collins, O'Connor, and Bossy. All other commissioners are in attendance. And I'd invite all of us that would like to join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so um, I would <coughs> entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And <coughs> any opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, so we are then on our first topic is the consent agenda that includes the previous meeting minutes, personnel memo 634, and policies for second reading as listed. So I would entertain a motion for the consent agenda. So moved. Second. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 And any opposed? Consent agenda carries. And next up we have public comment. So um, the board, re we have two people that signed up. Board requests that speakers be courteous and respectful. And the board will not engage in public discussion or dialogue at this time. And the speakers are to address comments to the entire board, not an individual nor the audience. Those that wish to address the board need to know, oh, that's there. And each person um, will be allowed to speak once on the topic with a two minute limit. So first of all, we have Emily Collin. No, Emily Collin. Okay, we'll move on then to Heather Hoke. Welcome, Heather. If you can just state your name and town of residence. Yes, my name is Heather Hauk. I am a resident of Rutland City. Thank you. I just wanted to update the board on a situation that um, we had have currently going on. Um, I am a parent of four kiddos, all in Rutland City schools. Proud sports mom. I think there's nothing better than engaging our kids and you know keeping them busy with productive things to do. And um, so many kids with the start of school were you know, hoping to go back to positivity, to normalcy, to structure, and so many kids look forward to sports. So I know our boys soccer, which my oldest son plays, was so excited counting down the days for soccer to start this fall. I did email the board in its entirety about um, the start of this situation. Um, for those who may not have seen, the synopsis was we attended the mandatory sports meeting at the high school, there is one for the middle schoolers, um, at which point we're supposed to meet the coach. We, all the children, um, separate by sport, and when we went to meet the coach, we were told, unfortunately, there is no coach for the boys' soccer team as of yet. Totally understand, you know, we're understanding people, this is the world that we live in right now, and we struggle to fill up positions. Um, the varsity coach was very remorse and said he's doing his best. Please, if you know anybody, have them sign up. Bring that name forward. They don't even need experience. We can help them. We can teach them. We need these, these kids involved in positive things. So um, the moms that were able to attend, this was a meeting that the day of the date actually changed. We didn't even know it was supposed to be that day until um, the afternoon. It was supposed to be August 29th. was changed to August 25th. So only the parents in attendance even knew what was going on. We immediately started a group thread of moms who were there to try and band together and solve this problem the best we could and help administration. Um, we reached out to a few people, struggled to find um, anyone that could commit to the time restraints. Found an option who is not only has coaching experience, but is currently employed within our school. Um, so we were like, yes, this is amazing, this will work. We were Heather, told just, by administration. You're at the two minutes, so if you could just wrap okay. up, please. Thank you. So we were told that our option <coughs> could not work. We were given no answer. Why? We'll figure something out. So fast forward now, Tuesday came, the practice was supposed to start, we still have no coach. Our boys showed up to practice. There was uh, Coach Black, the varsity coach there on Tuesday. 
no idea what was going on. They were told probably practice on uh, Wednesday at Rutland Town, for which they had to find their own ride. Um, and then practice Friday at the middle school. We also didn't know who the coach would be at that time. Stay tuned. We're all hopeful, but at this point, their first game was scheduled for today. So at best, last week, at best, they would have three practices. No one was notified of what was going on, only the moms on the chain of text thread. The school didn't notify anyone because there was no coach to tell people. Um, moving forward, the weekend came. We made it through last week. Awesome. Three one-hour practices. Their first game was scheduled for today. No information, no notification from the school. Monday comes. These boys don't know. Do we have practice? Where do we have practice? What do we do? We don't have uniforms. The girls' team has uniforms, has had been coached for five days, is ready to go, and these boys are lost. There's only seven of them because there's no one to lead them. There's no one in the school to recruit. So there has since been someone thrown into this position, which we're thankful for a living body to step up. But this person is so last minute thrown into the situation, they didn't even have balls. They didn't have a sign-up list from our school. They didn't have any contact information of the kids that have been signed up for over a month now. Currently, we have seven boys. Last year, there were 20 because of lack of communication. And this situation could have been handled weeks ago when we reached out saying we found a solution. But it was pushed to the side. So now, our boys are suffering. We want to talk about equity all the time. Any family that's not on our Facebook chain or our phone chain, these children don't even know that soccer is an option right now. There was no phone call, no email, no notification. So not only is this um, unfair to them, it's far less than an equitable situation to those who look forward to something to do. The seventh grade kids, I don't know any of those parents. We couldn't go find them. So um, it, it's really sad that this was a situation that could have been avoided. And at the end of the day, it's at the cost of our children. We sit here and we talk about equity, but the kids who come from families that aren't, have internet access, that don't have rides to Rutland Town because we don't have a coach today, is far less equitable. The school has nothing to provide for them. Okay, thank you, Heather. It's been five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we can resolve this moving forward. Did an Emily Collins come in? Okay, so public comment is complete then. All right, we will turn it over to Holden for the student rep report. All right, um, students at Stafford are working hard to pass all of their safety assessments so that they can begin working independently on projects within their program. Uh, our batch of school night will be this Thursday. We are excited to welcome students and their families. We will begin in the RHS theater, spend time in individual program areas, and wrap up with a community barbecue. The salon at Stafford will have an official grand reopening on Tuesday, September 27th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. and all are welcome to attend. Uh, Rutland Middle School has excitedly jumped into our identity project. Students are working towards academic standards in all areas in this interdisciplinary unit. Uh, we will host resident artist Super Stories in November to help support the culminating project for our identity unit which will be a patchwork mural made up of student artwork. Uh, Rutland Middle School students spent Friday at Branbury State Park for a day of team building. Uh, it was a huge success. We are incredibly proud of how responsible and respectful our students were. Today, we began a school-wide vocabulary recovery program to support our students build and gain vocabulary awareness. We are looking forward to sharing our progress in the future. RHS is off to a good start. We are jumping right into homecoming week this week. Uh, this week we have a different theme for each day, including Jersey Day, America Day, Pink Day, etc. Uh, we're seeing lots of good participation and student involvement. We will cap off the week with a student-led pep rally on Friday, during which we will honor all of our fall teams. Thank you very much. All right, next up is the central office reports and the superintendent report. I'll turn it over to Mr. Olson. Happy to see my face. <laughs> um, thank you. I wanted to update the board on the portrait of, of a graduate initiative. We're starting that up, and we've met with our consultant that's uh, helping us prepare for this. You, you have heard about this from Ted and Mary Beth, and I'm just going to give really the 
the board, but really the community, a little bit of an update on this. The portrait of, of a graduate is a it's a process that's reflective. It allows the whole community, the whole school community, and the broader community to participate in what we see as a community as our vision for what our kids will, will become when they're done with school with us. So it's, it's a collective vision of what we aspire to with our students. There's three main steps in this process. Uh, the, the most obvious step is that we're trying to articulate for the community, with the community, for, for all of us really, what we aspire to with our students, what our hopes and dreams are for these students. So we're trying to get that, that vision clearly. We also want to go through a process of, when we do this, of understanding what the skills are that students will be uh, needed, need, what they will need for skills when they graduate from high school or graduate from college or go into the workplace. So the skills and the kind of mindsets that they'll need to be successful in the real world. And then we have those two things that we're, we'll be working on. We'll have to then take back into our school system and consider what are the implications for how we set up learning opportunities. So if we want students, for instance, to be collaborative and work together in teams, it's a pretty common 21st century skill, we have to make sure that we're doing that in our schools. We're teaching that and we're practicing that. So we, we develop the vision and then we bring it back and make sure we're, we're teaching to those skills. Um, this exercise allows us to tap into the ideas of our constituencies inside and outside the buildings. And the format is through this team called the design team. The design team is a, hopefully a large group of people and they'll consider those three points that I mentioned. They will meet four times from October to January for about two to two and a half hours each, each session. And that design team articulates what we want to see in our students at the end of, at the end of school. The impact for us, or the, the importance of this, is we will have, at the end, a clear vision of what we want for our students. We should have this clear portrait of a graduate. We also hope to engage the community in that vision, help the community, un community understand what we're shooting for and have the community buy in. And we're also trying to make sure that if we are expecting students to be able to be um, capable with 21st century skills that when, they, when they go out into the real world, we have to make sure that we are teaching to those skills and we're adjust, adjusting our instruction that way. So it begins next month, October 20th is the first date for that meeting and we will be reporting to the board on the proce process all along. I secondly want to update the board on um, the initiative that the board sent back to the high school about developing a mascot and a moniker for our schools. I was able to speak with Greg last week and um, talk about how the process is going to be set up. He's basically going to follow the same process that they, that they used last time, although since they went through it once, they should be able to be uh, <coughs> more efficient or, or a little quicker because they've got some of the work already done. For instance, they understand already what they want to do for uh, what the values are behind a mascot and, and what a moniker should be. So they've got that part set up. They're going to use the student senate as, as the student body that facilitates this process. Uh, we will, like we did last time, they'll have input for names, nominations for moniker and mascot coming from students and the, the larger community. So they, last time they had set up um, a way for people to email in some of their suggestions, or I think they used actually a Google form process. So they'll do that again, and then the Student Senate will be able to condense these names down to what the, the most popular are, and they'll eventually go through a uh, voting process with RIS, RMS, and RHS for students to choose the, uh, the mascot that they think makes, you know, that they, they appreciate the most. We'll sum submit that to the board for approval, and then the board's role is to make sure that the, the moniker aligns with the law and the policy that you talked about earlier. So that's the process. Um, we, I think they, sh like I said, they, they should be able to move quickly on this, although we had some COVID-related absences the last few days of school, so we're a little bit hoping to start already, but we'll have to get going once uh, people are back in the building. Um, that's it, and we're going to have administrators talk about the opening of schools. So Excellent. So then next up is the opening of schools report and highlight. 
we have an order of principals are coming in or who's running the show <laughs> <laughs> start with the young ones huh <laughs> Thank you. Look like 
getting to know you, empathizing, being able to show up as you are, and essentially just creating community. So I'm very proud of RAS for that. That has been a great effort on all our teachers and uh, my fellow administrators. In addition to this, today at RAS we started um, our very own adventure programming for students. So we have a school counselor leading a group of students at each grade level, Tuesday through Friday, during, uh, for adventure-based programming. So these kiddos get to today, I'm trying to get rid of the They went to the Chittenden Reservoir. Tomorrow they'll be at Pine Hill Park. Thursday we have a group going to Pine Hill Park and somewhere else, I can keep track, they're so busy. Um, but it's 20 kids for each slot, and this is gonna rotate and serve as, a, serve as an intervention service to some of our students that might need more community skill building and social emotional supports. So lots of fun things happening at RIS. So, hello everyone. Um, at Rella Middle School, we're doing similar things to what everybody else is talking about. We too um, are looking at common language and signage and things to ensure that our students are following routines for hallways and bathrooms and um, all of the common areas that we have. Uh, students have also worked on their classroom expectations, so in every classroom we have the expectations for the teacher and the students, which makes it really so much easier for um, uh, substitute teachers and people like that to go in and be able to help support the classroom or anyone else who's supporting the classroom as well. Um, I won't be redundant with what we've basically been doing, but our three goals are working on our project-based learning, our advisory program, and um, community connections. So to those goals, I just thought that I'd share a couple of small things that have happened um, over the week. Um, one is that Sarah Borkowski and her students have opened for the second year what we call Middle Ground Coffee Shop. So we have a great coffee shop where the students make us coffee and we have to pay for it, of course. And um, also this year they're going to bake goods so that we can um, kind of incorporate that as a learning experience as, um, in both baking and um, money and using money. Um, we have a lot of new students, as Megan was just saying, um, a lot of new teachers, a lot of new students also, a lot of new students to um, Rutland City Public Schools, um, which has been a little different in the last couple of years. One student in particular, so I talked to him, obviously, and um, try, to, try to figure out, you know, their identity. We work on our identity project in the beginning of the year, and kind of like, you know, what's your identity, and how does that potentially change if you move to a different location. One of the students is from Key Largo, and she said, I said to her, what do you think the biggest difference is between your school and our school? Unbelievably, it was composting. She said, I kind of heard that word before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Well, we do a lot of composting up here, not just in our school, but in Vermont. And she said, yeah, it's really kind of weird. <laughs> grow up with it you're used to it if you don't then you're not so but she thought it was kind of cool um, also uh, let's see um, I did want to comment on um, our trip to Brambury Beach just because I have to say that we brought uh, close to 250 students and about uh, 30 adults I would say to that beachfront and it was just amazing if you can remember what last Friday was the weather was picture perfect there was very little humidity and it was just it was a day to go to the beach literally and our kids were just amazing they um, we had team activities that they did we had things like they were um, at an art table they were painting little pictures that they then put um, came back and put in a tile formation on one of our bulletin boards that was our brand new art teacher and it was pretty amazing because I said to her well we've had tables in the past <laughs> do you want to try it she don't, obviously she's only worked in our school for like what seven days she said sure we can do it she painted rocks she was uh, you know they they did a great job um, and we had the typical fishing and swimming and those type of things but Brambury Park that experience is great because we get to have some of our kids go to the fish hatchery and they do a hike around Silver Lake and there's just a lot of different activities all kids get to pick two activities so um, they a lot of them were taking risks that they never had taken before so they did just a great job really a lot of teaming that went on and um, we had one kiddo who um, afterwards it's just they were all getting along so well and um, we asked him you know how, how did he feel about it and he said you know I give seventh grade a five out of five <laughs> and I thought that was pretty good and before I left I just wanted to share that um, we do have our open house I know that Holden talked about it briefly but it just a plug for it it is next Thursday September 22nd from 6 o'clock to 730 and families 
um, will be able to come tour the school and we're going to have a kickball uh, tournament for our houses and this is the first time that really parents have been and families have been able to come into our school over the last couple of years and just be part of the I mean we kind of did it you know a little haphazardly last year but to really come in and see the school as a whole so we're super excited we're going to have kind of a light hot dog supper hot dog chips you know drinks that kind of thing so um, we hope all of our Rutland Middle School families will be able to attend thank you Hi everybody, um, I'm Jen Wigmore, I'm one of the associate principals at the high school and I'm representing the high school tonight. Um, so the first thing is we have had an amazing start to the year. It feels normal, it feels great, kids are learning, they're excited to be there. It really, it has a really great vibe at school. I just, it feels different, which is really, really, ha makes us really happy. Um, we had an orientation for our ninth graders on the very first day of school, and then the second day all the rest of the students came back. But um, again, great students. Um, we had a meeting with them. They were, they were engaged, they were listening. They, it was, they really wanted to hear what we had to say, so it was, it was great. Um, we also had class meetings with each of the student student groups, um, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, and we went over some things, again, really engaged in the discussion and what we were talking about. So it was, it just, it feels great. Um, Holden mentioned the homecoming weekend. The hallways look great. If you came into school, you'd see, you'd go down some of the hallways and each of the um, classes has a different hallway that they decorate. And it, um, there's a lot of, lot of decorations in the hallways when you go down. Lots of writing on the walls and very positive things. And then on Saturday, um, we have, well, we have the football game on Friday and then some other games also. And we have a dance that, we'll, um, that we're hosting on Saturday night. And the other thing that's really exciting is that, um, like Megan mentioned, in her school, we have some new staff, and I've had personally, and I know the other administrators have had the opportunity to get into these, the new, the classrooms of these new teachers, and we are so excited by what we're seeing. They are, they're amazing teachers, amazing instructors. They're developing relationships with students, and we're just really, really excited about what we're seeing. Um, Melissa Connor, director at Stafford. Um, like everyone, we're having a great start to the school year. I feel like Holden gave a great report. I don't really, really need to say much. Um, but a couple of um, things. Today, um, our engineering students were putting their skills to the test already um, in their first challenge. Um, I got to be one of the judges. Mr. Bliss joined us um, for Shark Tank. And they had to develop a concept for a carnival game and actually build it. And um, we got to play these games. And they'll actually be featured in our fun day, our, our fall fun day, which will be happening in a couple of weeks during D block um, so it was great to see um, the ingenuity that's already coming out of these students a week and a half in um, so that was fantastic um, some exciting news our cosmetology program for the last year has been working with the state of Vermont to become a testing center um, so that people can actually test for their cosmetology exam and we just found out late this afternoon that we were approved um, <laughs> It was through great efforts of the two instructors, Paula Lavasser and Stacy Hutchins. It was a rigorous process. They had to write exams, submit them to the state for approval, go through site visits. Um, so it's going to just kind of like level the bar for a lot of our students who don't have the opportunity to travel to Barrie um, to take the exam. So we're really excited. They'll be able to test two times a year, both our daytime and our evening students once they have a high school diploma. Um, and then something I'm really excited about that also just happened today, um, we're working with Dr. Mike Rule with the uh, Marzano Research Group around the school wellness wheel. And we had a session with him today um, and our entire um, staff, office staff, everyone in, um, agreed and committed to starting every day with a mindful moment. Um, and so we're going to be doing mindful activities um, the entire school at the same time um, and really trying to do different activities so that students can find the one that works best for them and so that they can really take care of their mental health um, throughout the school year in a way that works for them. So we'll be modeling different strategies for the first month and then the students will all have their individual tools and what works for them and um, have those strategies to use. But every day, if you're a guest at our school at 9.20 in the morning, you'll be participating in a mindful moment with us. So we're excited for that to happen. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. it? I don't know.
know if Scott Corbett is uh, holding back. Yeah, I don't know. know. You're stay. always ready, man. What's well, the I thought team? of this last week. <laughs> 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 this last week 2.0 version. Um, <laughs> now you've everybody. seen the kids. Good Isn't evening, it? everybody. Um, Al Shrews Camp is off to a great start. Um, I've never seen kids so actively engaged and showing up to school ahead of time, so that's super awesome, even for September. Um, I don't know. Everything's just really going great. I don't really have a lot to say, except for that we're working on some stuff. Our open house is the 29th, I believe, Thursday the 29th. And we look forward to seeing our friends and family there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next up on our agenda is our budget planning and timeline. So Ted hiding out back there. I think he was going to work right up to the <laughs> right up to the minute if he could. Right up so until maybe the we're moving a little quicker than he. Now. I think we're moving quicker than you maybe thought. So. I was going to say we could bump to the next thing, but now Rob's looking for him, so. <laughs> Final calculations. <laughs> Last minute update. I thought he had at least 40 plus. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Way ahead of schedule. Yeah. I feel like we need the Jeopardy theme song right now. Right? <laughs> Are we more efficient if we start at six? Is that <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? We're already like, Dad, welcome to the show. My, uh, my apologies for the delay. You're running ahead of schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. First for everything. Uh, I'm impressed. Very efficient. So thank you. And again, my apology. I was just trying to get a little extra work in. Um, so let's talk about the uh, 2024 budget planning and timeline and hopefully you have a couple of the charts that I'll speak to in your in your packet. We start off with talking about what's new for the 2024 fiscal year and there are some pretty significant factors. Um, one really important point is that this year unlike the last two years we already know what the salary increases are going to be for about 90 percent of our employees and our salary budget and that's because of the multi-year agreements that were agreed to at the beginning of this year with uh, with the teachers and the education support professionals and of course the year before we reached an agreement with AFSCME and just so you'll know the uh, the agreed to and contracted salary increases for fiscal 24 versus this year 23 are all in the 3 to 3.5% 3 range for these employees, okay? The only group of employees for which we don't yet know the salary increases for fiscal 24 are the non-aligned team. It's about 10% or of our staff, about 50 employees. And of course, that's because we will typically come in the spring to the board with a proposal for their salary treatment. But naturally, what we've tried to do is to keep those kinds of increases reasonably aligned with inflation and competitive markets. So not current inflation that's being uh, <laughs> that's being reported. We'll talk about that. I saw Tricia shaking her head. What? Yeah, well, and, that, and that's because and that's because, as some of you may know, and I'll get to in a moment, the uh, the CPI print today was eight point three percent, which means that we have now gone six consecutive months of 8% uh, inflation or higher. Uh, but that's a story for another point. Um, so we know we'll, we'll have a really good bead on the, uh, on the salary budget. It'll be a function, of course, of the number of employees and then the mix of experience. Another thing that's new for fiscal 24, which will not impact the district's own budget and costs, but will impact the costs for our employees uh, is, is a system of new state pension contribution rates. The state, of course, has taken action to uh, try and keep the pension program uh, fiscally sound, and it, it has done so by increasing the rates 
that uh, employees are going to need to contribute in fiscal 24 relative to um, relative to their pension contribution. So just by way of example, um, if you were an employee that had five years or more of service as of July 2014, that's just the date that was picked, you were contributing 5% of your salary toward the pension plan. If you were an employee that didn't have five years of experience as of July 2014, such as a new hire, um, you were contributing 6%. The new scheme is going to have a series of rates that starts at 6% and goes as high as 6.65% for some of the higher earning people. So that's going to be an impact to, to people's bottom line. But of course, the positive in that is the pension benefits themselves are very generous relative to many other pension plans. And, and frankly, while nobody wants to pay more in costs, um, in order to preserve the financial soundness of those programs, uh, I'm sure our, our state representatives did the best job they could. Third factor is, up until now, for our special education activities and services, uh, the district would be reimbursed at 56% of the costs incurred for those services. Um, it, would be, it would be reimbursed at 90% of some additional services in certain high cost situations. But the state has decided to change that model. Um, Act 173's provisions uh, for educational programming are moving forward. And now Act 173's provision, financial provisions will be moving forward. And that will basically change us from a cost reimbursement model to more of a block grant basis. Um, I won't get into the technicalities, but our preliminary analysis in estimating so far is that that will lead to a reduction in the district's revenues of probably a couple of hundred thousand dollars relative to what we would have expected if nothing else changed. Now, I'll emphasize these are preliminary estimates. Um, I think that they'll probably change, but based on the information we have today, that's our best guess. The important thing here is it's not a million dollars, and there are districts that now are looking at anticipated changes, and you may have seen or heard about some of these districts that are very concerned that they could have very substantial negative impacts in their funding. And again, it just has to do with the complexity of the kinds of services you offer and the students and, and a number of other factors. So we'll stay on top of that, but the good news is on a $60 million annual budget, more or less, within a few hundred thousand dollars is something that I believe we'll be able to manage without too much difficulty. Um, fourth point, ongoing inflation for goods and services. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been running at 8% or higher. Uh, the, uh, the expectation for today's report was 8%. It came in at 8.3%, and some of you may have seen what happened to the stock market as a result. We had the worst day in the equity market since June of 2020. This is a rare occasion when today all 30 stocks in the Dow went down, all 11 sectors of the S&P 500 went down. It, it's a, it was a unanimous <laughs> reaction to the fact that um, with inflation continuing to run this hot, people are expecting now that the Fed will not have a whole lot of room to uh, perhaps ease off of its interest rate increases. So, um, you know, in our case, our financing is set. We don't have any floating rate financing. So we're good from that standpoint. But in terms of goods and services, um, we're getting, we're, we're going to be faced with a lot of challenges. One of the things that, that jumped out at me was that uh, the inflation rate for food, uh, all food, and there's various divisions of food, was 11.4% versus a year ago. That's the highest since May 1979. And by the way, just to try and place that historically, for those of you like me who are old enough to remember, that was when the Sony Walkman Cassette Portable first came out. So <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been a while. Um, no impact, a fifth factor is no impact for 2024 on the student waiting factors. Um, you know, we invested uh, a fair amount of great effort to work with um, our legislators and the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity to advocate for an update, bless you, and advocate for an update on those waiting factors and the legislation that was passed, uh, Senate 287, Act 127, will implement those changes or a reasonable version of those changes, but not until 2025. 
so our the budget will be preparing does not yet benefit from any of those factors um, if it's implemented the way it was written and as we hope we could see a significant relief factor in 2025 um, and then last but certainly not least um, an icon in the AOE Brad James has announced his plans to retire sometime in the next year probably no later than June of 2023 after almost 30 years of service and Brad has for many years been in a very key budget coordination role for the AOE you've often heard people talk about how complex the funding mechanism is and Brad is just amazing in terms of the coordination support he provides for districts all over the state those are going to be very big shoes to fill and the reason why I put it on the list of factors for 24 is because without somebody like Brad in there as knowledgeable as he is it's probably going to be bumpy for a lot of us but you know you always make do and we will so before I move on are there any questions about what we talked about for fiscal 24 I just, what did you say the food inflation number was the overall food inflation August this year versus August last year was 11.4 percent higher yes and uh, you, you can look at different categories. There are categories like food in the home, food outside of the home, like restaurants. Food in the home was actually higher. That was over 13%. So, so depending upon which categories you look at, it's, you know, call it 11, 12, 13%. So how is that number going to impact the... Um, the budget? Yeah, we... Because it when there was an increase from like three point something to six point something. You're exactly right, Stephanie. So what you're recalling is the increase that we agreed upon with our food service provider. Now we're talking about fiscal 23 this year, not yet 24. Right, so, yes. Uh, was 6.8%, which was the maximum allowable by the state of Vermont. And that went up from three points. And that went up from 3.7 the year before. Right right and of course when we were looking at 6.7 percent and you know an almost doubling of the percentage increase we thought to ourselves wow but then as we started looking at what food costs are doing uh, you know we realized that that seemed to be the reasonable thing to do because what I what I would be concerned about if I were you know running a food organization and, and we, we partner with fresh picks to, to follow what they're doing is you still want to make sure that your service provider pro meets the requirements for nutrition, you know, ample portions, all of that, while still not losing money. And it's going to be very difficult for them, in my opinion, or anybody, to recognize these inflation rates with the cap at 6.8%. We'll I, I personally want to monitor that very closely with other people in the administration to make sure that our, you know, our students uh, don't get impacted negatively as a result. Because is that going to be something, because with that, I mean, that's that 6.8 up to 11.4, that's, you know, close to doubling it. Is that something that we may have to look at and change? Anything is possible. Okay. The way I look at that is I, that one I can't predict. But, uh, you know, as you were suggesting, those numbers are so far out of line. It, it, like it's, we agreed to something that's just, it's not realistic. It's plausible that the AOE or the state government could say at some point we might need a relief factor of some kind that's, during the yeah year. that's kind of yeah that's yeah. where I'm going typically what happens is, <clears throat> and that's definitely you know that that could be on the horizon that's we'll just have to wait and see typically this cap rate is set based upon the CPI rate for food inflation in I believe January February of a calendar year so this, uh, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see where this continues because, you know, in not too many more months, we'll see February 23 and what that's going to be. So, yeah, this is an area we have to watch closely. Uh, you know, what's interesting about these inflation factors, too, is that that's in spite of the fact that, um, you know, gasoline went down as much as it did. And, uh, and to, that, to that point, you know, your core stuff like food, medical care, housing, those actually went up at a faster rate in August than they did in July, even though the overall composite is down. So, you know, it's all about what you're buying and paying for. So we, like everybody else, are going to be under, you know, a fair amount of uh, financial pressure, and we will have to do the best we can because, of course, our taxpayers are faced with the same challenges. Any other questions about this? 
Okay, let's go, let's go to page three, and this gives you kind of a high-level budget timeline, the, the development. The timing is very similar uh, to what we had last year. We've already started developing uh, preliminary expense budgets. Our, our request to our colleagues is to have a preliminary expense budget for each organization by the middle of October on the 17th with the caveat that we will allow them to continue revising and changing it. But for us to get a high-level overview initially in terms of where things look like they're going, we've asked for initial submission by October 17th for the expenses. And then on the grant revenue side, we're asking our colleagues to give us their first estimates by the end of October. That way we can spend the first few weeks of November before the Thanksgiving holiday doing our budget analysis and <coughs> potential updates. Um, once we're able to consolidate the input and the output, we'll be able to see what the net looks like and start to really consider what we may need to do. Uh, about it or we can conclude perhaps that things are fine but then what we're telling people is that while they can revise their estimated expenses and revenues during November we will freeze those estimates as of November 30th so that the business office and our team can prepare a consolidated overview uh, to review at the finance and planning committee meeting on December 6th as we typically do before we come to the full board of course we bring the proposal to the finance and planning committee for their guidance we would then use that interim week to make any changes that the committee suggests to us or provide any additional cases or analysis that they suggest would be beneficial to the board so that way then we would have a, a consolidated uh, and hopefully clear proposal for your group uh, on the 13th of December at, at your December meeting and then potentially if the timing works out but only after a board review of the planned budget um, the uh, city uh, alder board uh, requested an update which i could either do at their december meeting or january meeting so that's that's what we have in terms of that timeline any questions about the timeline and those steps okay great and then uh, on the last page i just um, I showed you a recap of some of the cost drivers that we've talked about. Um, the one that I haven't mentioned is the, uh, the medical insurance. Uh, you know, there were many years of double-digit increases until last year, and last year dropped from like 10% to 5.2% for fiscal 23. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see where that goes uh, for for this uh, coming fiscal year because as you know medical benefits and benefits in general are a very significant portion of our budget we've got uh, you know just to use some round numbers okay plus or, and this is a little plus or minus a few million you know our recent budgets have been about 30 million dollars of salaries and about 15 million dollars of employee benefits of which medical benefits are a very significant portion so, and that's out of your typical $60 million annual. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll be watching that carefully. We should be getting some input from our colleagues um, in, in, uh, at the state capitol as early as October. Usually they've got a pretty good handle on what the medical premiums are going to be by November. So when we come forward with the rest of the consolidated version to discuss with you, you know, in early and mid-December, we, we should have a pretty good beat on where that's going. Um, and of course, during November, uh, as things are developing, should you have questions or concerns, you know, that's not to say that you can't contact us, you know, and we'll be glad to provide information as best we can and tell you if it's going to change, it might change, but at least give you a snapshot of what's going on. Should we pull this information together in early November and have a, a surprise concern, you know, then of course we will uh, not wait. You know, we'll, through the Finance and Planning Committee, we'll figure out uh, any communications that we might need to have in the interim to give people an appropriate heads up. Because as always, the goal is try to avoid surprises so people have time to react, consider alternatives, and do the right thing for the school district. So that's what I had in terms of the budget. If there are any other questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank Thanks, Dad. The next up is the recovery update. We have Abby and Glenn.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Glenn Scott, Director of Buildings, Grounds, and Transportation. Uh, happy to be here with uh, my colleague, Abby Bradowski, to present uh, an update on uh, ESSER recovery uh, as it relates to construction. So we have five current uh, active projects as it relates to the ESSER funds. ESSER, uh, for those of you, as a reminder, is the Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. This is a federal grant program that's managed through the state. Uh, so the first project we kicked off this summer was our high school uh, phase one and phase two project, which replaced all of the carpeting at the high school and all of the carpeting at Stafford Technical Center. Um, this included offices, classrooms, our lecture hall, our band room, chorus, and the fine arts wing hallways. So it was a pretty significant project, and I have some uh, slides which show kind of some before and after. This is the office center support services at the high school. This is the uh, lecture hall, the before on the left, obviously. And this is the band room at the high school. And we also had a portion of, yeah, I'm sorry, yes, Kevin. This is the second time I've noticed there's little sections where the lines are red. Hmm. What's the significance? See in the middle of that aisle there? So the other, we that, added is a that little. just a design? Yeah, it just was a little bit of color splash to throw in there, so just kind of break up the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Stop you. Try not to do too much. Yes. A Very off. exciting. <laughs> That's a good catch. So there you can go. see that yeah, you're, it, doesn't it just kind of breaks up the, the pattern a little bit, adds yeah. a little color. Yeah. Yeah. Great catch. Good job, Kevin. This is the intermediate school. Uh, this is the one portion so there are five classrooms and this hallway uh, as you enter the building on the left um, so you can see the the brightness we've gotten a lot of positive comments it brightens the hallways it's much easier to clean and it creates a much more hygienic environment which is the purpose of of this as it relates to ESSER funding we we were sort of talking about this at the buildings and grounds committee uh, how's the noise level with switching from carpeting to How's the noise level, Megan? It's it's not a huge difference. We have yeah. one classroom that you know is a little noisy in in general. Um, <laughs> yeah. That are in there. <laughs> um, and we ordered a carpet, you know, like an area rug. Uh huh. It's okay. Fine. But the amount of teachers that noticeably, you know, commend our team for maintenance is it's great. Thank you. Great our maintenance team. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is one of the classrooms. You can see the carpeting on the left, and then we added a, uh, a wood grain uh, LVT with luxury vinyl tile in that in all those classrooms. And this will be the pattern that will go throughout the rest of the intermediate school as we get into phase three, which we'll which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, and then Allen Street, the second project that we were able to complete this summer. Uh, this was an addition of a French drain that surrounded the front um, perimeter northeast corner of the, northwest corner of the property. Uh, so basically, a lot of the water that was shed off that hill was ending up in the corner uh, of the mechanical room, which is right below the gym. This created a wet environment, so we were able to tap that, get it into the storm drain, and uh, eliminate that moist environment in the mechanical room, which in turn will create a much more healthy indoor environment for the school building. So as Glenn mentioned, we finished up the flooring phases one and two in the Allen Street Water Mitigation Projects. And coming up in the next two years, over the course of the next two years, we have first an ESSER van purchase, which we had hoped to bring to you tonight. It was postponed a little bit due to a vendor bid error. So we should be bringing that to you next month as well. Um, we have signed the contract for phase three for our flooring project. And I'm working on phase four right now, which has some interaction with our asbestos removal project. Our uh, HVAC project is coming up. We are building the RFP, which is the request for pr uh, proposals for, for with our vendor, our project manager, to go out to vendors sometime, hopefully in October. Our ESSER asbestos removal and flooring project RFP is currently out, and so we have vendors, um, quite a few actually, who are interested in that project, and hopefully we'll see a variety of bids, fingers crossed. And finally, our ESSER outdoor learning spaces, outdoor classrooms. We are still in the design phase. We've had to make a number of changes and a number of um, permutations to those designs based on architecture and now engineering. So that interacts with the stormwater permitting and the types of <coughs> other types of situations we have to deal with. So that's still in design phase, but is moving forward. 
we're hoping to lock that in to get it out to bid as Ted had mentioned that the cost of those have gone up significantly just since the mm -hmm. in the last 12 months that we've been in this assessment phase yeah, so we're aiming for December to get that out to bid I have a question where are you anticipating the outdoor learning space is there gonna be more than one or where will they yep we are anticipating at this point um, what we want to do and this is all cost contingent so we just received new information from the engineers that made change this a little bit and we want we'll bring that to you when we have a better sense um, but PPLC Pierpoint uh, Primary Learning Center has a pretty big redesign of their parking area an ADA accessible ramp to an outdoor classroom structure um, there and that's actually the most complicated but also the least problematic I would say of the project so far uh, Northwest School we're hoping to put in a surface for being able to play basketball out you know a paved type surface it needs to be permeable surface which make you know makes the cost change a little bit um, Rutland Middle School we're hoping to have an outdoor uh, open-air sort of meeting space cafe type style with some, sh some shade awnings and Northeast will hopefully have a, a full pavilion uh, sort of in their courtyard area that interacts with their playground did I miss one? Allen Street and Allen Street also a full uh, outdoor classroom but we're really still in the development stage and as costs change we have to really look at how we're able to adjust to that so those conversations are still ongoing and we learn something new every day mm -hmm. thank you Peter. thank you just one quick question regarding the uh, the van mm -hmm. um, I expressed my concerns at the uh, at the committee meeting that we have projects going on and typically have one vendor bidding for a lot of the projects even though we've sent information to eight or nine different different organizations asking you know soliciting bids um, so specifically regarding this van purchase being postponed did the vendor that did submit a bid pull it back because they made a mistake Correct. okay yep. um, was the they missed something in the specification something like that yeah they had okay. given us a cost that didn't include flooring and back seats <laughs> and so they want to make sure they put those costs in which is on their end I was happy need, that you kind of yeah, need a seat in a van you know it's not it. a cargo van so how do you skip the flooring it was, you know, I'm not exactly sure how in there, <laughs> but I was it. pleased that they caught it because what I don't want is a van that doesn't have those things. Right. right. So they caught it, we put it back out to bid, and then we've had some other interest and some, you know, hopefully we'll get more interest as we move along. So, But that's been the case, and each time we have fewer than three bids, we actually go through a process with the state to let them know that this has occurred and here's our justification for, for going with one vendor, um, and they approve it, and then we can use the funds for that. Well, it's not the state wouldn't consider it a sole source vendor because you actually went through an appropriate bid process yeah but you probably have to uh, you probably have to prove that to the state exactly mm -hmm. gotcha. yep. thank you could I, could I just add this is all this work or most of this work is addressing our facilities assessment that we mm -hmm. had a couple of years ago and it's federal money not local money that's helping to pay for it's a lot of these improvements so it's a good thing for the local taxpayer mm -hmm. So I was in room red 11 last night with almost a dozen people and like I, wa I was one of the first ones to walk in and I was like whoa it's so much brighter and like and that was like everybody that was in there like that was the comment how much brighter it is just by the different color of the floor so I just want to say that it was I liked it a lot. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Right. Next up, we have project vision update. And Assistant That's Superintendent Blitz. Well, minimize that for a second. Thank you so much for your time. I, I the purpose of my uh, presentation here on project vision tonight is really to get to the end point, which I'll do in a moment. And I'm going to say it twice. Tomorrow night at 6 p.m. at the intermediate and middle school cafeteria, project vision is holding their meeting there in that space. And they asked us as a school district to come up with some presentations to enlighten the community on how we're addressing the needs of students who may be dealing with uh, uh, being separated as a result of COVID, not connected, or maybe even having experienced some trauma. And so you'll have a number of presentations, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And you'll hear about it again at the end. For your information and for people in the community, there's a brief uh, piece about Project Vision's history there on the front part of your handout. 
And as you may know, Project Vision was formed in 2013 following a, a request for a community effort from Chief Jim Baker. And the vision is Rutland, one of the healthiest, safest, happiest places in America. And they always put in, we believe in Rutland. So um, that's what Project is, and it is a very rare and special collaboration of community people, agencies, and entities who come together to solve problems for the community. It's become a model for uh, other communities across the country, and as you may know, some of the people from Rutland have presented around the country. Past and current connections that the school has with Project Vision. We have people who sit on, uh, not only just go to the go to the monthly meetings for Project Vision, but also who are members of the committee. I sit on the uh, Health and Education Committee uh, for Project Vision. I also work with Community Policing. We have people who work together with the Education and Engagement Committee. And I wanted to make a special note that I didn't put here that this summer, Suzanne Engels, our own Suzanne Engels, who you met before, she was asked to go to Project Vision and present on the topic of adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, as we call them and the effect the ACEs or adverse childhood, childhood experiences can have on the actual brain development of children. And so what that means when kids grow up, they come to school, what are they encountering, how do they solve problems, how do they interact with everything around them. And Suzanne's, I happen to know because I heard about it, Suzanne's presentation um, was very well received and it's very informative because even medical professionals in our community aren't up to speed on what has been called the worst epidemic to, the country has seen these adverse childhood experiences. So thanks to Suzanne for doing that and helping us stay in front of that. And once again, you can see the end part of that is uh, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Uh, some school district personnel will be presenting to Project Vision. Uh, there are some, some of the usual reports. They'll hear from the mayor, the police chief, Commander Sheldon, and then they'll hear some reports on school programming. Our goal is to make reports that are about five minutes and then do some Q&A, get people engaged and interested and move on, and they'll hear from, I'll provide an overview. Uh, Marie Gilman will talk about Tapestry and Epic and connecting kids that way. Mike Norman will be there to discuss about the importance of engaging kids through activities and athletics. <coughs> Carol Baker will present about arts and community building there. Patty Beaumont, our own Patty Beaumont and her team are set up to talk about what you heard about are talking about their identity and their advisory program. And then Carrie Course and RIS will be there to talk about their restorative work and cultivating belonging in Rutland Intermediate School. And those are all things that aren't really earth shattering, but they are really targeted at addressing the needs of kids as they arrive at school every day. You heard Ms. Ingalls talk about we're teaching kids just about everything. And the skills and how you interact in a, in a large social community, that's one of the things they learn. So that's, that's what's going on. And if anybody in the community or any of you want to come and see the 6 p.m. Project Vision meeting, it'll be at the cafeteria at the middle school and intermediate school tomorrow night. Questions? Because I wrote down high school. Is it at the intermediate school? It's at the intermediate and middle school. Did I, did I get that right? No. Well, I, for some reason, I put RHS, and then you said that, and I was like, mm. I yeah. RAS, R R R <laughs> I would have showed up at the wrong school. <laughs> we <We'd> get you <laughs> there eventually. <Thank you>. Sure. <laughs> I would have figured it out. Um. All right. So, still in the hot seat, we have Assistant Superintendent Bliss with a curriculum development update. All right. I apologize for doing this to you. This is bad teaching, Mr. Olson. <coughs> you should never do this when you're teaching. However, I'm going to do it because I realize some of the things I want to show you, you can't see very well on that screen. You might not be able to see this very well either, but at least you'll know what I'm talking about. So if you take one and pass it around, the student. Yes. I wasn't getting you in trouble for no. talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did do it. I saw you leaning over, Mr. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. So yeah, I know that first one's kind of tough, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Those come in later when I'm going to pull up links that are on the presentation. But the first thing I want to let you know is that the reason I'm talking about curriculum is, as you can see on that first slide, and that's in your presentation that you have in your packet, is it's one piece of recovery. One of the most critical things we can do in our school district, or any school district, is make a targeted, aligned, guaranteed, and viable curriculum. That is a curriculum that all kids have a chance to access, all teachers de deliver within a system. So where are we working at? in a three-year project which started last year. 
and we use. You heard somebody already earlier today discuss that with, they're using um, support from Robert Marzano's company, which is Marzano Research. Um, in one of the tools, you'll see that. I think it might have been, was it you, Melissa? Yep. So they're using professional development from Marzano. We've used Marzano at the high school and in other schools before. And the approach to building and developing a guaranteed and viable curriculum that's outlined by Robert Marzano and his colleagues is the one we're using. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Having a system and a framework for the whole place makes it easier for everybody to fit in and understand. Our wonderful curriculum coach, Lorraine Bargman, who couldn't be with us tonight, uses this visual. It hangs on her office wall. I took a picture of it so that you could see the scope and sequence of the work we're doing. This one should be in your little packet so that you can see it a little more closely. And you can see it maps out year by year what the work is that we're doing and that our wonderful teachers are completing. So you can see in 21-22 last year, we did prioritize standards in every grade level and where they weren't existing in every course in the <coughs> curriculum area. Um, also last year, proficiency scales, taking those standards and saying how can you tell a kid or a student is achieving those. And this year we're diving into what's called scope and sequence. That's planning out the, the order of events and the timing of the delivery of the curriculum as students go through a year and also as they go through their K through 12 experience. And then next year, units of study and aligned assessment. And that's when we'll dive into the deep work of instructional planning, um, design for everybody, and then how do you assess it so that we all know what we're going to achieve. I love that. I told Lorraine, I, I took that photo as she was sitting there and I said, I'm gonna use this in my presentation. This is it's right on her wall. Okay, so now we get to this funny stuff that I handed out to you, that I said, this is not good teaching. But the first thing that's green, you see it's green. It worked. Almost like it was planned. Um, this green piece is an example of across the top, kindergarten through eighth grade, specific uh, prioritized standards in Common Core State Standards English Language Arts. And on the far left, this is in that screen, there's just one example, and it's the Conventions of English Standards sorry, Conventions of Standard English Grammar and Usage in Writing and Speaking. And then as you go through K to 8, everybody's got a standard that aligns to that that's based on the level that you need at each grade level. In a perfect world, a student enters, achieves each standard along the way, and as they go out K to 8, they're ready for high school and those standards. Something like that was built for every content area. So that's language. This one I'm showing on the screen is reading and foundational skills. Some of these are blank because they're not applicable at those grade levels and those standards. Speaking and listening, writing. And Lorraine and her team and all the teachers did a wonderful job of organizing that in such a way that anybody who walks into the school district from now on can say like, well, what do I teach if I'm in third grade and I'm trying to do speaking and listening. It's right there. The next thing that's in that funny packet I handed you looks like this. And it looks like this. These are proficiency scales. And so every standard needs a proficiency scale, which is basically the definition of how you know a student is achieving the standard, or they're proficient in that standard. The particular one you're looking at is called Grade 3 English Language Arts Reading Literature 3.1, standard number 3.1. And the teachers looked at this and created, using this Marzano framework, what the standard looks like. A 3 is the student is achieving the standard. A 4, they're exceeding it. And you can see there's a 2 and a 1.5 all the way down. And we use and have used for quite some time a 0 to 4.0 scale. So every standard has a proficiency scale, thanks to the teachers and to Lorraine's work. I'm gonna move fast. I don't expect you to take that and internalize it right now. The next one that you have in your happy little packet is 
this piece that's kind of red and black, and it says scope and sequence. And way at the top it says directions, comments, and red. The reason this one looks the way it does right now is it's just a model for the work we're doing this year. So one of the first things Lorraine and the leaders did was they created a model or a template using Marzano's work for how you build your scope and sequence. And then to, to show people it's really not that hard, Lorraine actually mapped out a mock example of what it would look like if you did a scope and sequence for a specific specific standard. Okay? This one happens to be science, 21st century learning expectations, there's essential questions, the duration and the overarching standards, the unit of study and content, evidence of the proficiency, how do you know they're going to make it, so on and so forth. And like I said, in the future, Anytime anybody walks into the district and they want to know what am I teaching at grade three, four, or five, what are the standards, what's the scope and sequence, how do we align all together, we'll be able to show that to them simply. And with some professional development, we'll be way more aligned than we have been in the past. Um, that's the work that will be done this year. The next two years, we'll build units of study and the assessments that go with them. These first one, two, three things that you had in your packet, the standards, proficiency scales, the scope and sequence, that's kind of the science and the mechanical stuff of teaching. It, it just is what it is. Do A, then B, then C in this order. Take about this much time. You know, that's how we all work together kind of in the science. The art comes in as we do units of study. How does a teacher take that science that's put together and that everything's aligned and say, this is how I'm going to express this and engage my students in that work. That's the work that really excites teachers. This other stuff is fun, you get to work together, but it's mechanical. The next step next year is the kind of work where a teacher can really get excited about, I'm really building, developing, designing the instruction I'm gonna deliver with a team of people in my same grade level or my core content. And then the aligned assessment is kind of mechanical, but you build it into your development of instruction because you have to know where you're going and what your targets are and how you're going to assess it before you build what you're going to do to get to that point. I wanted to make sure you saw that. To me, I give it to you in 10 minutes or less. That'll be three years worth of work um, done on time, on the rain schedule, if we're fortunate. She's built in some, some cushion there. Uh, but she's a wonderful leader and prepares and supports the teachers in the schools. The teachers have been doing excellent work. And I just wanted to make sure that you and the whole community are aware of that great work that's going on and that we're always focused on trying to make sure instructional learning, which is why we're here, is as good as it can be for us. Questions? Peter? Thank you. A, a few, if I may. Um, a long time ago, I was on the curriculum committee, and I, I felt at the time it was extraordinarily important because disjointed, um, um, a disjointed uh, uh, approach towards curriculum just doesn't help the, the kids uh, go from one grade to the next. It just it, because it's disjointed. So, just some questions here because this is this is really good work, but this is hard. Does this start at the states, and I don't know if they're still called grade expectations or not, uh, and then work its way down such that those are the standards you're talking about? This is great. He's dating himself. <laughs> yes, I am. That's the reason I said I These don't are, know if they're yeah. still called that or not. So, so all this They used to be called grade level the expectations. Grade level expectations, the GLEs. You remember well. Patty Beaumont remembers well. I'm sure. Um, so these are actually built off the Common Core State Standards. When the Common Core State Standards came out, Vermont adopted the Common Core as their standards, along with 40 other states to start with. Um, and so that's the core standards that we start with. And then what our te team of teachers do is they decide which standards in each vein are priority standards or supporting standards. That's the first step. And then these standards that we are then working with to develop up to develop these standards, that all would feed into, and again, I'll date myself by calling it the Nickleby test, the, having the students ready for the high stakes testing that, that goes on in each of the schools, or not in each of the schools, but at, at appropriate grade levels every year. An interesting question. Boy, there's a lot to talk about there. Um, however, I will say that, yes, yeah, so the idea is that 
a larger and widely accepted set of standards leads to the ability of the state to offer an assessment to see how every child in the state is doing given those assessments. This, the new test is called New Balance, Smarter Balance. The Smarter Balance Assessment, good. I was, I was blanking, I was thinking. Sure, and all of a sudden it I came was, to I mind. I was thinking back to all night, <laughs> no child left behind. And no, no I, I threw you a curveball with a slider attack. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Like Peter stepped out of a time machine. I know. <laughs> so, he, was, he was setting you up. Yeah, totally. So the Smarter Balance Assessment is the current assessment that the state of Vermont uses. It has been made pretty clear to us that that will be going away in favor of some new assessment very soon. Um, but yeah. the intent is, is this would prepare oh, yeah. the students for obviously a lot of things, one of Correct. which is to, to make sure that they can accurately demonstrate via testing what they've actually learned. Yeah, and that's, that's one way that students can demonstrate their proficiency is through a written standards-based test along with many other things. And then final question, does everything that, uh, that is um, embedded within the, uh, for instance, your uh, English language arts reading literature 3.1, the overarching standard, does this all build into um, the grades or whatever we are now calling them, the assessments that are, that are made of our students and then, and then put into a, uh, a report card to bring home? Yes. So one of the last things you saw in 23-24 was the aligned assessment. So the aligned assessment, once you get that, that feeds into a report, which gives us, you know, information out to the community. I will say also we're working with um, Patricia Agner and her IT team about how we can make the progress students make toward those standards and proficiencies even more transparent for our community. Um, some of the tools we have allow parents to see really up to the minute and live live timing for lack of any better term real time uh, information on how their kids are doing Allison may remember way back when if, if even if my kid this was the best I loved it as a parent some parents not so much but if my kid missed an assignment I got an email not from the teacher but from the system all the teacher had to do was say like this assignment is missing and I could forward it to my kid and say hey guess what you're missing an assignment Oh, it's ah. a lot. We still, we, it's similar what like, we have. It's lovely. Then you get the, I was at a soccer game. I couldn't hand it in. That's, that's not my problem. You just got to <laughs> fix it. I'm just telling you it's there. Um, but, Dad, hey, nobody's watching, I'm sure. Um, so if I may, one follow-up. So does that mean that we still have that credit recovery system that was that was started back, way back when I was here last yes. time? Absolutely. Times two. Yeah. Good. Yep, or Good. ten. Yeah. <laughs> I have a child who's an expert in it, so I get a lot. I can answer all your questions, <laughs> not on camera. Charlie, we've we would a all, lot of that we, we would all either are there or have been there. Us. Oh, yes. it's fun. Charlene, not. Um, I just wanted to make a comment, a general comment that my takeaway from this information. I feel like it. Not that I, I'm, I'm not going to understand all of this information, but I, I like the content and it, it shows that there's a lot of thought and a lot of structure and a lot of. Uh, work that went into to building this there's a lot behind this so I, I appreciate the fact that you you you, know, you present all this information not that we have to understand every bit of it but it, it really proves that there's a so much going on behind the scenes and and work it takes quite a bit of time to get you know put this together so thank you for saying that great. I'll make sure I pass it along yeah I had a question no others. Um, so my question is, you know, you, you outlined the years and, and the steps of that. How are we cyclically <coughs> keeping up with that and up to date? Um, and are there other content area experts that are following other trends and input? So how are we keeping up to date with that and in a cycle? So one of the things that's built into this growth and development of the guaranteed and viable curriculum is at the end of this year the idea is that scope and sequence is supposed to be done by the beginning of March that's hustling when that's done one of the things that will happen is take a look back at the priority standards and the proficiency scales and say are those still relevant real and part of who we really are or did you learn something in the last year that says maybe we need to adjust here or there the truth is, once you do this work, you stay in a cycle of plan, do, study, act. 
So the plan is you have this guaranteed and viable curriculum. Do is the delivery. Study the assessment and everything you get back and how it's going. And do you need to take action to adjust it to make sure it's going the way we want? That's part of the the ongoing learning of this. I'm not sure I understood what you asked about. Are there other? So is that happening every year? Oh yeah. Okay. Because like the way it was outlined there was like year one, year two, three, yeah. three, four. So I just wanted to be sure that that it is yeah. being reviewed on a yearly basis. And if it was only being reviewed by one person every four years, yeah. if boots on the ground content experts. This was as as part of the great thing about this this approach was the all the work that's built Lorraine is organizing but teams of teachers get together and wrestle with what's a priority and what's not and how does this align with if I'm teaching this in third grade how does it align with what will be taught in fourth or what's supposed to be or what we're targeting to have kids know and understand when they come out of second grade that's the, and this this three-year build is the biggest part of the project and then you're definitely in an ongoing review cycle because as you know things change too Great question. All too often. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Yep. And team. Yep. We'll make sure it passes. And so next up, we have our committee reports. Um, with first the building committee report with Kevin. Once again, Glenn has made my job superfluous. Um, <laughs> the building committee See, report, report was done by Glenn, <laughs> Glenn and um, Abby. 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 And I was going to call you Andrea, and I knew that was not right. So, okay, sorry. And when I got scolded, yeah, Glenn and Abby did my job again. Saying. So, thank you very much. Uh, they're doing a wonderful job, and even doing other people's jobs. <laughs> okay. All right. And then next, we're on to finance and strategic planning, which seems like Ted gave quite the rundown on a lot of that as well. So, on to Mary Beth. <laughs> he did, and um, you know, Bill, you got a great team. Uh, Ted. <laughs> Ted's going to jump in, I think, and give us a little bit more detail on. on um. So at, at our uh, finance and planning committee meeting last, we focused on two topics. The first was the fiscal update and proposed timeline for the 2024 budget. We covered in a little bit more depth most of the material that I reviewed with you a little earlier this evening. Uh, we did get into you know some discussion about how staffing levels and mix of employee experience will affect our costs. We talked a little bit more about enrollment trends uh, and some of the challenges. But the themes were basically the same as we talked about. Um, since giving you that overview uh, a little bit earlier and mentioning some of the CPI statistics, I thought, you know, probably what I should do is give you an actual example from the school district rather than just CPI metrics. So just as one example I saw this week, um, we got a request, a requisition, uh, to purchase some art supplies. Uh, we buy clay for our pottery class. And so the clay is, uh, is $38 per box. And I was just curious, so I asked, how much was that a year ago? And the answer was $28 per box. That's a 36% increase year to year. So the, the point of that is that, you know, we, we talk about inflation, but different goods and services are going to be seeing very different inflation rates. And, you know, to manage costs, you don't think, okay, well, I'm going to cut, you know, the number of students who can take pottery by 36%. That's not what we want to do. So we have to find other ways to balance out some of these cost increases as they come in. I mean, it's, it's really, these, these kinds of numbers numbers are just incredible. So we talked about that. The second area of focus from a strategic plan perspective is our proposed actions and timeline to implement the portrait of a graduate process along with consultants from Battelle for Kids, which we've spoken about briefly in the past. Um, we've agreed upon a timeline that's going to involve four meetings, one per month starting October 20th and then uh, in mid-November, mid-December and mid-January to bring constituents from the community together in these four roughly two-hour meetings. And the idea is going to be to get broad constituent input from the community in terms of what we believe as a community are going to be the most important competencies and skills 
for students going forward in the 21st century um, and potentially to assess whether that is going to have any implications for the curriculum and how we allocate resources. The amazing thing about this, as you may have heard before, is Battelle for Kids, which has done this exercise for many school districts around Vermont and the country uh, and receives great reviews, they, uh, they are insisting that we make sure that we invite at least 100 people to these design meetings with the goal of uh, bringing as many representative groups as possible. So everybody from teachers and students and parents and grandparents to uh, administrative officials. We're going to be inviting people from the City Board of Aldermen and Alder Women. Um, so we have our thinking caps on and we're, uh, we're uh, developing plans to invite as many as possible that can represent our community. So you will uh, hear more about this within the next week or two. We're developing our communication plan. We're going to be sending invitations out to people to participate in what we call the design team in these meetings meetings um, and those will go out before the end of the month in preparation for the first meeting October 20 and then this process would culminate in the middle of January not only with the last design team meeting but also with a report that Battelle for kids will be helping us develop throughout the course uh, of this process so uh, basically again what we did was review with the committee these are what we believe are the next action steps the approximate time and and just to make sure that we have those bases covered and although she couldn't be here tonight Ali McAuliffe who's our senior financial analyst for the district is the point person on arranging a lot of the logistics and the programming aspects working directly with Patel for kids um, not only is, is she really great at that but it's a great developmental opportunity for her so you'll be hearing more from Ali at subsequent meetings so if I can answer any questions I'd be glad to try and do that we're looking forward to this process we're really excited about. We think uh, hopefully we'll get as many people actively involved as possible. Battelle did say, nobody can come and just sit and watch. If you come to the meeting, you must participate. That's a requirement. So we, we think that's heading on the right track. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Anything to add, Mary Beth, or you're good? No, no, we're good. Okay. <laughs> so we'll move on to the um, superintendent evaluation process. And back to Mary Beth. All right, good. Uh, just a couple of quick updates. Not a lot has changed since we met just two, I think it was just two weeks ago we had our last meeting, but just um, a reminder that Bill's uh, prior evaluation, which includes a, his a previous self-eval as well as his final eval, will be available here in Longfellow um, for review by board members. Um, who will sign um, kind of a recommitment to confidentiality while they're here and they will not be able to remove anything from the building but they'll be able to review it um, while being here and can't make copies or do, I do anything like that. Can we so. take notes or no? Off what we see? That's a really great question, Stephanie. I mean, uh, I, it, I mean, we can't take anything with us but, you know, just by in conversation, yeah, if that could be something. It would be if there's notes, just like executive session, you can't write notes and take them out with you. Okay. Yeah, that'd be, yeah. yeah. I think that'd be. Because you can essentially just copy what's written on a piece of paper. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. I, I would guess, yeah, that mental notes, as Allison said, would okay. be. Okay. Just yeah. want to make sure. Great question, clarify. though. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Um, second thing, really on behalf of Kathy, who um, is with us on Zoom. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of Kathy, who is our chair for the policy committee, um, just to remind all of us or any public who want to input on the uh, to to come to the, the September 20th policy committee meeting, which is where we'll look to really hash out and really put um, a, some more structure and detail into the policy regarding the the superintendents evaluation so it's not so vague and we can put a little bit more uh, specifics than that and it'll be on the 20th of September um, to really kind of ha hash that out and take the proposed timeline that myself and Kathy have worked on with Bill that really came from 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 Bill and put it really into play um, and make it official for the coming years um, and then just lastly I'm working with um, with Rob and, and Patricia to get the 
digital version of the superintendent evaluation um, on SurveyMonkey and ready to go for the uh, October 1st release of that uh, to everybody. So, and I think that's it. Any questions? What time is the policy meeting? 4.30. That's what I thought. Thanks, Kevin. According to the back of your minutes. Oh, where I could have looked, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why, I'm, that's why I knew it. As we're both putting stuff in our it. calendars. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to say it out loud, though, because then if yeah. anybody else wants right. to show up, that's right. they would know what time it is. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Mary Beth. Yep. Next thing on our agenda is uh, unfinished business. Any unfinished business to come before the board? None. Next up is new business. Any new business to come before the board? All right. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for the board to convene an executive session for the purpose of discussing the evaluation of an employee. The premature release of information regarding those subjects would place the board at a substantial disadvantage and invite Superintendent Olson with us. Second. Okay. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you.